Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining me here today. My name is David Brackett. I am the chair for the Languages of Limited Diffusion work group here with the NCIHC. And it is a real honor for me this morning to be able to be sitting here virtually with Dr. Julia Puebla Fortier and asking her a few questions that I know all of you are going to find very insightful. Just a little bit about Dr. Julia Puebla Fortier before we get started with getting to know her a little bit more. She has worked for over 30 years to improve health services for migrant, minority, and other culturally diverse populations, specializing in policy development, analysis, and program implementation. With the World Health Organization and the International Organization for Migration, she was a facilitator for two global consultations on migrant health. As the director of Diversity Rx, a non governmental organization focused on good policy, practices, and research on healthcare for diverse populations, Dr. Fortier led the development of several key policy tools, including the US Standards for Culturally and Linguistically Appropriate Services, also known as CLAS, C-A-C-L-A-S, Prior to her work with Diversity Rx, she was a staff member for the U.S. House of Representatives Subcommittee on Health and the Environment. And the list goes on and on. She has a wealth of knowledge in her industry, has been a true leader and pioneer in our, in our industry, as well as a pioneer here for the NCIHC, which is why we get to sit here 25 years later after launching this incredible organization uh, because of people like her that helped launch it. So without further ado, Julia, thank you so much for joining us here today. Thanks very much. It's really nice to be here and talk. And we've got, got a few a few questions for you. We're going to go ahead and start off with the first one is, could you speak about three items that propelled you on the path toward linguistic inequities? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, um, I come from a bilingual, bicultural background. My mom was born in Mexico, and I learned Spanish at home. Um, and then around about the time that I went to college, and then afterwards, um, not only had I studied Spanish a little bit and done some research in Mexico, I started doing some volunteer work for a community clinic in Washington, D.C., where I was a um, an interpreter for Spanish speaking prenatal patients. And so that sort of got me into that first realm of, you know, what happens when there are language barriers to healthcare. And that was at the same time I was working on the Hill for the Subcommittee on Health and Environment and sort of very interested in big national health policy issues. And um, sort of simultaneously with that free clinic work, um, I started working on the first Disadvantaged Minority Health Improvement Act. And as part of that process, we were approached through um, through two representatives' offices, Representative Manetta and um, and some other offices, um, to talk about um, language access issues in community health clinics. Um, and so that was really the first time that I'd heard from frontline providers about their their challenges in delivering uh, language, delivering healthcare services to a lot of different diverse populations with different language needs and how essentially there was no funding for that um, in that. And so that of course resonated with some of the practical experience that I was having. And we decided to look into that on a policy level to see what HHS was doing on this issue. And it turned out that there was still a lot of work to be done at the federal level, um, including recognition for these needs and community health center funding, but also looking at how these issues might be dealt with across other federal programs. And that brought us into touch with the people who are working on Title VI of the Civil Rights Act and the provisions that were in there, but only sort of haphazardly enforced um, depending on the part of the country. And so the more the more investigating we did to find out the dimensions of the problem, the more I came in contact with people around the country who were doing critical frontline work in this area. And so um, folks in Massachusetts with the um, MMIA, what used to be the MMIA, and folks in California and in Washington state and in Minnesota. And slowly over time, um, I got to meet some of the leaders, um, which are also um, national council leaders, um, people who were working in a variety of different settings. And we started to talk about, well, what can the federal government do to make your work easier and to make these issues more prominent? And so my guess that segued 
from mm -hmm. sort of working in the community space, from the personal space to the community space to the nat national sort of policy space um, where we did come up with some provisions um, and get that into the legislation. But at the same time, that was sort of an opportunity for me to um, to really make connections with people who perhaps hadn't had um, hadn't done a lot of work with with national policymakers and some of the national health stakeholder groups, and to begin conversations about um, how do we raise visibility of this issue and and how do we do it outside this policy policy sphere? So not just in government, but with the hospital associations and the medical associations and all of the other big national health players. And so that was the beginning of a a multi-decade odyssey um, wow. to to really um, get these issues on the map, as I said, with a lot mm -hmm. of other very important people, both on the Hill, but also, right. I think, more importantly, off the Hill. Yeah, definitely. Definitely takes a, a village, doesn't it? And yeah. and another question for you. So what was your role in the development of NCIHC? Yeah, so that, I think, started by my being invited into some of these regional conversations, like those in Massachusetts around the development of the code of practice and the code of ethics um, and the development of a curriculum for medical interpreters. So being part of those conversations where these issues were starting to be put into play and then having those conversations in other places like um, other parts of the country. And, and, and slowly as sort of we all came together through various meetings that were hosted by different people in different places, um, I think the conversation turned towards the idea of how do we have a national presence on this issue? There needs to be a single unified body that is really promoting this agenda, um, a go-to point for whoever it is that wants to ask questions or to say, you know, what do we need to be doing around language access issues? And so over discussions with many different players over the years um, and for some of my encouragement around the advocacy agenda and the policy agenda, the sort of notion of the National Council began to come together. Um, and so um, lots again, lots and lots of meetings with lots of different yes. people um, as part of that. And then we sort of put together um, a board, um, a, a volunteer freelance sort of board and Cindy Road and I were the first two co-chairs of that board when mm. the organization first got started. Excellent. And as far as just your looking back at your journey for, for language access, what would you say that the language, language access has done for you? And where do you see your journey with language access uh, going? Yeah, well, it's been it's been really exciting to be part of something that sort of touches on my own heritage, but also brings me into contact to, with other people around the world, actually, who are grappling with these same issues. So um, while I was working with the National Council and with with and, and on the Hill and then after the Hill, I was involved in this effort to develop the class standards. Um, so develop some of the first policy um, research around that and then help lead the national consultation processes around that. And then right after that came out in 2000, I moved from the States to Europe and um, over the next 10 years got involved with conversations in the European Union around cultural competence and language access. And so my, my sort of part was to bring all of the experience that we had developed over the years into the European scene and to help those different countries that were at different stages of development begin to develop their own policies and their own advocacy strategies. And then from that, um, also became involved with WHO and IOM, which were um, beginning to see migrant health as an important issue, um, kind of reluctantly at first in the beginning, but um, more so as the years went by. And that was sort of my role in, in helping co-facilitate those conversations. Um, and then uh, after that, I went to Japan and then was actually through some people um, connected to MMIA was a, or the International Medical um, interpreter Association, able to connect with um, interpreter advocates in Japan and look at their language access issues there. So you could say that it's been kind of a thread um, that's that I've taken with me in different parts of the world while continuing my work with Diversity Rx for, for over 30 years. And, and that has just been an amazing opportunity to get different perspectives and 
and to see how it works in different political and cultural contexts and, and to meet really cool people um, in many different countries. Um, so that's been an interesting an interesting part of my journey. Wow, what a what a journey. That's just truly remarkable. I mean, it's going from from Mexico to DC to you said to England to England to Japan, then England or England to Japan. Um that's uh that's incredible. Wow, and you've done so much so much and continue to just really really touch lives and we just we just thank you for all, all of your hard work in our in our industry that that a lot, a lot of times people outside of our industry don't don't see we we see it and the the impact that you've had has touched I, i'm at this point millions of individuals um because of your hard work and our, our industry is younger as a as a professional and it takes people like yourself to be able to to come in as the pioneers and really pave pave the way for for the future and so we can continue to carry carry that forward so we just thank you for for what you're what you've done and what you continue to do in in the language access space and particularly what you've done at uh, nchc uh and helped us get to the 25 year anniversary mark so well yeah. it's been it's again it's been a real privilege to learn from people who are yeah. so expert in this i'm not a professional medical interpreter but bring a different set of skills but it's it's really all of all of the interpreters, all of the front people, frontline people like yourself, who are really doing the the super important work, and so I'm glad to just have been able to to go along in that journey and and help help guide as I can. Yes, well, thank thank you so much for taking the time as well to to join us here this morning. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you.